just kick it off with where we, where we start there. What do you do about the splitting of the legs in which deploying these radical new technologies to the change in organization's view of itself when you're trying to reinvent the whole approach, you know, we're going to in, embrace DevOps, we're going to get rid of the IT management team, we're going to get rid of staging. How do you approach those kinds of transformations in, 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 a, in, in larger business? Years uh, and has seen lots of technology transformations. Where do we start, Keith? You you look like you gagging to give me an answer to that one. So, so basically, are these mics on? Uh, I don't think they are. We get the mics on on the. Uh... Hello. Um, yeah. So we we had um, we had a couple of customers who started using kind of DevOps kind of technology. So we we have a platform OpenShift and they they brought it in and um, because they didn't have kind of high-level stakeholder management buy-in, it failed as a project. So I've seen this not working when dev teams have brought kind of DevOps technologies in um, and containers and it's failed. I think our learning from that project was you need higher-level buy-in within the organization. Um, you need management coaching uh, at the kind of higher level. Um, and I think if you come into an organization and you approach it and you don't have that in mind, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure from the onset, when, when we had an engagement like that and, and it didn't work, we kind of took that lesson on board. Um, and I think, you know, I think ThoughtWorks, for example, do some great stuff in this area. If you look at the kind of level when they engage and they try and do organizational change management, um, th that, that's what we've seen. I think some of the organizations aren't ready to accept it. I think there's more of that going on these days, but I think you have to, you have to get the higher level buy-in from, from the start. Okay, Jason, you, you've done uh, a transformation like this in a large traditional organization. H how did you uh, approach that challenge? Yeah, exactly. So I think the, the reason that we have the success that we've had thus far is that we actually did not do it within the large organization, right? We pulled up the ladders. We said, uh, you know, to our <laughs> IT organization, thanks, guys. Um, we'll be back around on this and kind of educate folks and uh, be that kind of change agent across the organization. But it was really important for us to encapsulate ourselves from that organization so that we can go out and build all these, you know, progressive architectures and platforms, change the culture. Culture. Um, super, super important for us to do it in that model. And now we're seeing the, the merits of that throughout the organization because they're saying, huh, these guys were able to do this. Maybe that's a pattern that we can take forward. And so now we're spending a lot of our times kind of educating folks across the organization, whether that's uh, our security teams and teaching them about the whole big bad cloud uh, or our internal IT teams to say, look, guys, embrace this, right? Embrace these new paradigms instead of uh, kind of, you know, uh, bracing and grading against the change that is uh, really inevitable at this point. Okay. Peter. Yeah, I'd agree with the, the whole point made there about uh, having high-level buy-in. Um, a lot of times when, when we go in to do uh, a, a microservices type engagement, um, either be it consultancy or a platform build-out, we have that high-level buy-in. Yeah. And those are, the, those are the engagements that go really well. I can think of a few cases where we've gone in and suggested, you know what, this platform looks just right for microservices, and we get told we're crazy. <laughs> Girl, go away, right? But in most cases, actually, you know, you know what happens is there's a there's an engagement process, and we'll go through, we'll we'll, we'll talk to those guys again and again, and we'll touch them for a while, and eventually, um, I can think in pretty much every case they've come around and said, you know what, I think you're actually right. Let's let's do this. Okay. Adrian, you you've taken guilt through that journey. Yeah, I made some cheat sheet notes here. I, 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 so the first thought, the first thought actually is, is uh, yeah, like <clears throat> a friend of mine, Eric Bowman, said it was really interesting. Like people are enormously hard to refactor, right? And I, I think it's kind of like you know, you look at an organization. I'd rather go into the old Ruby code base that we have than try and refactor, or reorganize people. It's enormously painful. Um, so the the way I think you do it is, I think, uh, pretty simply. Um, the worst thing you can do, I think, in the world is come to an organization or an existing structure and say, guys, we're going to do it this way, right? 
Because the first thing people are going to do is they're going to say, don't you tell me what to do, right? And, and I think that's kind of recognizing that's important. So the first thing I think is um, build consensus that there is a problem. Like in Gilt, we knew we had really, really long cycles getting stuff to production. Uh, we knew it took us ages to get stuff to the, um, to the data center. So there was a whole bunch of stuff there that were like, there is clearly a problem, right? Then I would say propose this, propose microservices as a solution, right? Kick it around, get some ideas there, right? Um, and then I think that you know the way we did it was we literally uh, we like I say we decentralized the power and we just let teams start right and pick pick off a problem and do it with this microservices way and be a shiny example of success. Mm. Because there's one thing that we've done is, as a general principle, we've said that voluntary adoption is really important. If you're doing something, either a technology or an architectural choice, and if you have to push it on people, then you're probably wrong, right? But if everyone looks at you and goes, that is awesome, you know, we would like to do it that way, right? Then you're winning, right? And, and then voluntary adoption will lead the way after that. So. Fantastic. Okay, Peter, security. That hasn't really been talked about today. We, we've all seen very high profile uh, data breaches with very large companies in the last couple of years. Um, uh, my own company was involved in, a, in a, uh, the Mexican government putting their complete database on the internet without a password or a, or a username, <laughs> which is not a good idea, I can tell you. Um, how, how do we integrate security capabilities into a microservices architecture? Do we need to integrate security capabilities into a microservices architecture? Okay, that, that's a pretty big question. So I'll caveat anything with, uh, the, with just the uh, legal disclaimer that we're not a security company and we don't uh, give any, uh, any guarantees on that. Cheat! Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, what can I say? What can I say, right? Um, we're but, all I mean, experts. You, we're on a panel. To, you're still going to have to apply the same security principles and practices yeah. that you would in, in any type of systems development. If you're putting something that live that, it, that is critical, you're still going to need to, you're still going to want to catch the low-hanging security issues yourself. Mm. You want to engage with a third-party pen test company. Mm. Security experts, right, who know what they're doing. Um, you might even want to make that an order automated part of your deployment process. We've heard a lot about uh, continuous deployment pipelines. These are all mm. great things. But that does mean that you have um, a higher rate of change through your production platform. Uh, and, and obviously, the higher the rate of change through the production platform, the, the, there are potentials for security holes to creep in. So uh, there's certainly a, a case for making um, automated uh, pen testing of some kind uh, part, of your, uh, part of your deployment process. So again, I, you know, I'm all for automating everything you possibly, you possibly can, right? So if you can automate that, and in a lot of cases, a lot of the, the low-hanging stuff can be automated. So consider that as part of your, uh, your deployment uh, process and, and your general DevOps pipeline. Do, does anybody on the panel want to comment about, you know, what are the specific approaches for it? What would you need to do differently from a traditional monolithic security architecture, which is username and password or Kerberos or LDAP or encryption on the wire to a microservice architecture? Is there, is there a different approach? Are there new things we need to think about? Yeah, I, I think there are some. I think a couple of folks have touched on that a bit. So, so Christian had mentioned kind of this notion of, uh, you know, your, your, your hosts, your instances should have a certain lifetime because the longer they're living, the more potential that there is for security patch issues, for kind of dormant bad actors to be on your system somewhere. So that kind of hygiene really helps from a uh, security perspective. Um, the other thing with uh, microservices is, you know, the, the other idea around uh, security and depth, right? So I think you have kind of more, uh, you know, at of that depth with uh, with microservices. So, how are containers secured? How are we signing uh, all parts and all aspects of our infrastructure? And that that notion of immutable infrastructure. I think those are the the particular aspects that microservices both uh, enables and uh, and really calls for. Yeah, I really like that idea that you talked about earlier on of cryptographically signing everything that goes into production. I haven't seen too much of that to be honest, but I think that's definitely the way forward, Keith. That signing is definitely something that, that's been thought of for containers. So, um, you know, in the container space, effectively saying, I won't let this container run in production unless it's been signed by my ops team. So, my ops team, I trust my ops team, and potentially you have a vendor and you trust them, and you go, I'll trust the containers that come from this vendor, that come from this ISV supplier, and that my ops team run on. And all of that stuff will run in prod, but, you know, maybe your lower environments, you kind of go, okay, those guys can use stuff from Docker Hub, but people who aren't using, you know, 
um, if it hasn't gone through the kind of security scanning process that an ops team will put in place and using things like open SCAP and container scanning, if you're, if you're going down the whole container route, there's a whole load of tooling in the container space to do, to do design, to do scanning, um, and, and then to do patching and management. So when there is a security fix or, or there is a vulnerability, that, that you can patch that vulnerability very quickly um, and let's say there's a heart bleed or, or there's something that comes out, you can effectively update and patch your entire environment automatically without going to your app teams. So, you know, doing those things and, and just updating a layer or something. And are, are, are there specific capabilities in Red Hat that support this or is this something that's generic to the community? I think, so there's a lot of the stuff we're doing which is open source, we're okay. building it into kind of our enterprise offerings um, and, and I don't want to start pitching kind of Red Hat products but yeah, if there's, there's a, that <laughs> <laughs> Pitch on. away, I, I pitch on. away So yeah, th th that, that's Red Hat's kind of, you know, that, 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 that's our mainstay so we, we have a whole ecosystem of things around satellite and around all of w what we're building around containers to, to kind of approach that and I think that, that's one of the biggest value adds that kind of Red Hat see in this space is that we, we're kind of in tune with security and patching and vulnerability scanning so also i think black duck have some some good offerings on this as okay, well yeah and um, th th they have some good stuff on containers okay do we have any audience members who'd like to lobby in a question here we go down the front here on my right your left hi thanks um there's been a lot of talk today about um docker and about that being a way to to, to, to use it with microservices, and obviously that makes a lot of sense. But I just wondered also about alternatives, in particular um, serverless architectures. I'm um, thinking of things like AWS Lambda, which, although I believe under the hood is implemented using Docker, that's kind of transparent <laughs> to, to, to the developers working with it. And I wondered if the panel had any insights of working with serverless architectures with that as a way of deploying microservices? We've started. Uh, we, we have a, like a, a number of our teams are doing a lot of work with Kinesis Streams and Amazon. And uh, you know, that, that's great. It turns out if, if you've got like SNS queues and Kinesis Streams, then um, using the lambdas to actually process the information on the streams is, is great, right? And it's actually, I think it's interesting though, because at that point, it's just, it's, it's, it's in a sense, it's almost zero deployment, right? I mean, it's just like, it's just a, a, a little fragment of code that you're releasing. Um, I think for us, I mean, you know, if we go back to just, you know, the, the, the classic kind of service model, um, like a whole bunch of our, our, our services that we've been developing since the last, I'd say, 18 months are all deployed now using Docker, right? And we're very happy with that right now. Um, before that, we were using we were using VMs. We were actually using RPMs. You know what I mean? And it, we, we were working in a world which I thought was actually very interesting because we moved away from it. It's actually really funny. We we moved from a world in the data center where we had RPMs deploying multiple services on the same machine. Right? Bad idea. Don't ever do this. Don't do it at home. Right? Uh, so then when we moved to Amazon, right? We actually were in a world where then every Every service, every instance was being deployed on its own with an RPM, right, to a machine, right, in Amazon, right? So we had all the isolation we needed, and then we brought in Docker as well, right? So then we had a service in a container in a container on a machine, right? Um, so there's something a little bit sort of perverse there in terms of a container within a container. Um, however, I think the, the general thing that we found is that by using Docker, we get this, this immutable unit of deployment, right? And that's the real attraction. Once you create your Docker image, it is what it is, right? It's not gonna change, right? And so while our AMI instances may change, uh, the Docker containers don't, and that, that actually has been pretty, pretty key for us. I mean, I'd, I'd agree the immutability uh, of, of containers is, is a very attractive thing uh, to have. Um, I guess a lot of the deployment work that we do, we still care about the underlying VMs. Um, we still care about that in the, in the deployments that we do, we, although we're deploying containers on top of them. So we still have to kind of un understand and, and script the deployment of the infrastructure as well as, uh, as, well as the, the containers that, that sit on top of them. Uh, I do think that, that it's interesting and we will see much more of that serverless type of architectures um, over the next few years. We do some work with uh, other, other cloud providers, Joint, for example, uh, Triton, um, which is a, a kind of serverless uh, con container-based um, uh, platform. And I think that those are, those are very interesting approaches. Um, but at the moment, I think we still have to care about the underlying VMs. I think 
the industry may move away from that over the over the coming uh, over the coming while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think for for us, when you look at Docker from a dev perspective, uh, it's all about Docker and Docker tooling and whatnot. Uh, and the Docker API is uh, has a fair bit of ubiquity at this point. Uh, when you look at kind of different scheduling frameworks, that's when you get into different containerization at that level, although they all understand kind of the unit of Docker. So you might have, if you're using something like Cloud Foundry, uh, then maybe you're using, you know, Warden and uh, containers. Uh, Mesos has containers, uh, Joyent and Triton, they have their own notion of containers. But at the end of the day, they all accept Docker as an input, and then they may translate that into their own notion of a container. How does Red Hat feel about serverless architectures? Does that mean the Red Hat business goes away? No, no I, I, I don't think so. I think, I think, um, I think if you're if you're gonna, I, I, the one thing I would be wary of is is just lock in. And um, the one thing that we we kind of see is, as people are moving towards cloud, you can go all in with Amazon, and that's great. But then you're just totally locked into Amazon, and you know, good or bad, that that's maybe not a bad thing. So if you if you're specifically talking about lambdas, just just be wary. You're walking into that world. It can be great, but you're locked into that world, um, and you may not get out, Certainly. and then you're tied to that. So I think that's the, the one thing we'd be <laughs> we'd, we'd be wary of. Uh, it's just it's always good to have a place where you can go. I actually just want to move and, and not be locked in. Um, so I, I think you know, I think I, I, everyone's going to move to cloud. Just be just be aware of, of how I, you I deployed an online backup service. I built one in 2006 with Amazon, and they had two services. S3 and EC2. If you go to the service page now, it's what I like to call the, they're the Win32 of the internet. You can go in, but you can't come out. Once you adopt 12, 13, 14 of those API calls, you've locked yourself into that. But more importantly, you've locked yourself into the semantics of their queuing system, which may change over time. But then no one got fired for choosing AWS, right? That is, is that the bang new on the money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, Absolutely. Go. Nobody's going wrong picking AWS. It, it's interesting. I wonder, though, are we actually about to come back full swing, right? Back to a world where we deploy things into an application server? Like like J two E E, is that is that really don't what we're? That. Don't, don't say know, that, please. No, no, don't, don't go there. <laughs> uh, it is really J two E still exists. Apparently, they're at version eight right now, and um, it's really sad, but but it's still out there, you know. But it is it is interesting because uh, working with uh, with actually with, with James Strachan, he was one of the first guys to say all this stuff that we're putting on the same Java virtual machine. Just don't do it. Why don't we just deploy, uh, you know, a single instance of, this, of Tomcat or whatever for whatever service we're doing, right? I think we moved away from jamming everything in on top of each other. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, but you never know. Everything comes around, right? You know, Adrian, so. you're giving me the fear. I know. Yeah, <laughs> you can see the cold sweat. I don't want the fear. Yeah, <laughs> that's scary. Do we have any other questions from the audience down here at the front? Uh, what does sort of a DR strategy for persistent data look like on a service that's spread across sort of 100, 200 containers? Um, you know, how do, how do you guard against, you know, say 50 of them fail? Um, how do we get the service back to the state it was in? Is there, is there good work being done on that? Or? <coughs> Cluster? Potentially. <laughs> cluster, cluster, smushter. Yeah, I've used uh, <laughs> cluster services. That's, that's, that's a no. I, th I think <laughs> cluster, cluster, cluster FS. Oh, cluster FS, yeah. 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 I think it's interesting for us. Our our attitude has actually been: we used to solve that problem ourselves, and now we just hand it entirely over to Amazon, right? And if we ever get to a point where Amazon is broken, then the internet is broken. So there's bigger things to worry about. Um, that, that, that's true. I think what's, what is interesting, I think, is in terms of their margin for error, right, it's still always better than we could do on our own data center, right? That, that was one of our big realizations, right? Um, we, do, we, do, like, we, we do things kind of proactively. Like we actually still have um, a data center as well. Um, you know, the data that we would have, like, like core data in our core database, uh, we'd actually replicate into the cloud. Right, so there's always going to be some kind of replica there in, in, the, in the event that something terrible happened, you know. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I think you do have to be mindful. If you have something that's a real chestnut of very valuable data, then I think you have to look outside the system for for some kind of um, uh, some kind of DR recovery solution. There's a couple of uh, databases can help you with that. I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I don't think that microservices per se change that. Really, it all still comes down to the actual database that you're using and what are the, uh, the kind of the, the traits of that database. If you look at something like a, you know, a Cassandra, like a fully distributed model, do you, do you ever care about any one instance or, or a DR scenario there? Um, and then with things like Mongo, uh, you have some fantastic uh, you know, DR um, situations. Kafka as well is another thing that gives you that, that replayability, that ability to not lose data um, because you can cluster that, you can back it up, you can replay events, um, you can uh, take advantage of that kind of nice ecosystem and um, not have to, I guess you guys, uh, Adrian, you leverage RDS um, for database needs on Amazon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're using uh, Dynamo, we're using RDS, uh, we're using Mongo in our data centers. <clears throat> so we have like a, 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 yeah, we've got it all over the place, so. Yeah. Cool, I, 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 I think that you've touched on a very important topic yeah. that we're probably gonna get into tomorrow. I know we've talked, we're gonna talk about serverless architecture tomorrow, which is you're gonna have to give comfort to the existing providers of all of these services that microservices aren't gonna break that model for them. And so there has to be a transition. I mean, I, I was actually talking to Peter at the break and I'll, I'll throw this question open to the panel. What's the Z series mainframe guy gonna do with microservices? If you scratch the surface of any retail bank in the UK or in Ireland where I'm from, at the bottom of that stack is a Z series mainframe that does all the transactions in an overnight batch to decide what your balances are the next day. How are those guys going to use microservices? Well, those aren't going away anytime soon, right? No, absolutely not. And in, in, in no way are they. Um, but that, that, that doesn't really matter in a sense, right? Yeah. Because the, the systems we're talking about are going to sit way in front of those, way in front of the stack, right? So you're talking about systems that are the front ends or back of the front end. Yeah. Uh, where you actually need rapid innovation and rapid service delivery right, and rapid change, you don't really want rapid change on your the systems that are handling your bank balance, right? That is correct. <laughs> Jason, is there in the mainframe somewhere in ADP? Oh, maybe a few kicking around, yeah. <laughs> Well, and do you uh, guys have to integrate with that stuff? What do you do? Uh, we no, unfortunately, we don't have to integrate with them mm -hmm. directly. Uh, we are working with those teams for them to expose certain APIs that we can leverage, okay. uh, but not direct integration now. One one thing we're kind of seeing some some of our government customers and financial services clients what what they're looking at doing is taking those big kind of legacy tin things and just chipping away at them piece by piece. And their strategy is they know they can't change it overnight or over a, a two-year time frame, but they're taking like a, a five to ten-year strategy of in ten years' time we want to be off this. And what we're going to do is we're going to chip little pieces away and take them out and kind of microservicify them. And then at some time in the future, we know we're going to be set up so we can migrate off it and not take that big hit of a, a massive transformation project, but just do it piece by piece iteratively with other programs at work because there's no way they're going to get this whole program or work funded to take, you know, the, the crown jewels of whether it's, you know, a big, a big government department that processes money or, or whether, whether it's a bank to, to take those core systems out. So mm -hmm. the, the strategy seems to be chip it away piece by piece and then ultimately enable yourself to get off that at some point in the future, maybe five, ten years away. I don't know. Right. <laughs> so I, I actually know. Like, I, I do think about this, right? So what I want to do is, when I get really old, right, I want to learn COBOL or PL1 and retire to Switzerland, right? Uh, we should all do it. Honestly, as a career plan, we're going to make loads of money, right? You'll be a millionaire. I'll be a millionaire, but I won't need it. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I think I think it's interesting. I think there's uh, so there there is a great analogy in the microservices book about viewing microservices and your estate as a city, right? And you know, the, there's the new buildings, there's the old buildings. You know, when I think of, so I actually worked for a while in Credit Suisse on their SO architecture, which was which is making their, um, you know, their IBM transactions available. You know, uh, using using Corba. This is a, a long time ago, um, and I think um, I think it's interesting. The, you know, if you think about those those rock solid systems that have been running there for like 20 years, they are like a Roman castle like big, fortified, buttressed walls. They're not breaking, they're fulfilling their purpose, they're doing absolutely fine. So I think that there really may not be an impetus to actually ever come off them, you know? I think it may be there for the long run. 
Yeah, and I think that's when you kind of really scare enterprises when you come in and say, <laughs> container all the things, microservice all the things. There's just not a need sometimes, right? Like yeah. you said, if something is there and solid, let it be. Let it be. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I work for one of the major Irish banks. You'll know them, Adrian. It's one of the big ones. And, and they ran a course while I was there, and this is like six years ago now, and they said, we don't care what your background is. We'll give you two years free training to become a COBOL programmer on our mainframe. <laughs> Anybody can apply, and it's completely free. We'll give, pay, uh, we'll give you time off work. We, are, we cannot find COBOL programmers for them. And they still need to change that mainframe code pretty yeah. regularly. Yeah. Even just to change the order of the batches is a big job. And, and yeah. that's a serverless architecture, by the way. It's, it's COBOL programs <laughs> running on bare metal, practically. <laughs> Anyway, enough of mainframes. I can see the audience <laughs> losing, losing the will to live. All us oldsters up here. Are there any more questions from yeah. the audience? There's one there. Um, so there's been some talk today about going, essentially deploying your microservices straight to production and removing your staging environments um, and using advanced logging and sort of analytics to detect quickly if your deployed microservice is broken. Um, I have a suspicion if I went to my business and said, <clears throat> let's remove staging environments and deploy straight to prod, they would have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> what would any sort of answers be to that? So, um, so we, we had a, um, a religious war um, in guilt uh, over the last five years, right? And it swayed between the guys who, um, who, who wanted to test in production Right, and the guys who said absolutely no way, right, and it really was bloody. You know what I mean? People would get into a room, they would leave the room with exactly the same opinions they come into the room with, right, <laughs> hating each other, right, and it turned out that the more we dug into it, um, it turned out that about I think about 85% of the teams of the engineers at Guilt, right, it turns out that the services that they're writing they can actually test them in production because they're largely write-only services or services for which synthetic data can be injected without causing harm, okay? So it's interesting, it's like, so 85% of the people were right, they could test in production. But the team that handles checkout and order processing and payments is going absolutely no way, right? I mean, if you ask me to test in production, then I have to I have to code at at, at a fraction of the pace because everything I do has to be so so careful. I simply you know I can't take any risks, right? So um, there's very interesting. So um, what we realize there is there's a different approach we're actually going with for for that team, which is okay if you're if you're actually in one of these sensitive areas, let's actually be really thoughtful about saying, well, what is the test environment that you really need, right? And it's a subset of the overall architecture. It's not, it's not, we're not trying to replicate the entire architecture. Maybe we're trying to replicate just eight or nine services, right? Maybe that's the problem that we should solve just for that team, right? But, but leave everybody else kind of uh, work in production. So blended approach. Test more secure parts of the system in isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't, if you guys... No, good answer, yep. I'll take one more... <laughs> yeah. Well done, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll take one more question from the audience, if there is one. Down the back there. Hey, uh, this is another question for Adrian, I guess. Um, so there's the notion of um, decentralized decision making. You said that you're trying to, to push decisions as far mm -hmm. down as possible. Um, but you also mentioned that you're a Scala shop. So I'm just wondering, like, it's, that is a bit of a, I mean, there are certain decisions that apparently you do make at a, at a higher level, and I'm just wondering how you, how you do that. It's a good question. So, um, so it's actually interesting. If you look at, like, one part of our stack is still largely Ruby, for example, okay? Uh, then we moved to Java, and then uh, it was actually interesting, you know, one of our, our chief architects at the time uh, was so keen to say, right, everybody, stop what you're doing, we're all using Scala and SPT, right? And, um, and effectively, um, he, he was actually coerced not to do that. It was very difficult for him, right? Mm -hmm. But we actually persuaded him not to do that. And instead, we went through a much kind of longer process, which took him maybe about, let's say, a year to actually come to fruition, which was simply to say, OK, you love Scala? OK, go start this, this project over here. Implement it brand new, Greenfield in Scala, 
right? Um, and show everybody how awesome this is. So this was actually voluntary adoption in action. And then it turned out that the usage of Scala kind of just all of a sudden infected, right? And then all of a sudden we realized all of the teams had stopped programming in Java and were now programming in Scala. So in a sense, when we actually came to the point in 2012, we were like, oh my God, look what happened. We're a Scala shop, right? And nobody disagreed anymore. So that, that's how it happened, you know? So I think, um, yeah, it was, a, it was kind of voluntary adoption kind of led the way there, you know? Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I can just share our experience there. It's exactly that. I mean, we, when we talk about kind of, um, you know, the, the, these cultures and these uh, situations, right? Uh, and what bottoms up really is, uh, it's a community. And so I think, Adrian, you're kind of commenting on the effects of the, the results from the community versus a mandate down to the mm -hmm. community. Uh, so the same for us, right? So we're, we're a Node.js shop, primarily. Uh, we also do Scala. We also have some Python. Uh, and our, our, kind of, our idea with the teams is, that's great. You want to do Rust. You want to do Lua, uh, whatever it may be. Um, you have to, one, uh, prove it out. And then secondarily, uh, but just as importantly, you have to teach teams how to fish, right? You have to teach them how to fish in this in this new world. So um, other development teams, hey, how do I how do I plug in uh, developers into your stack? How do I operationalize the services that you're creating? Um, you can't just kind of introduce a new language and say, hey guys, please figure this out for us. Um, so that that's kind of the model that we found uh, that really works well for us. We're the same, even though we're a, we're a consultancy and we use a lot of a lot of Node.js, we still de uh, devolve all of the autonomy down to the guys that are responsible for delivering the projects. So there's no one at the top saying, you got to do it this way. Uh, it's actually the guys that are implementing on the ground that self-organize, figure out what tools they want to use, how they want to best use them, uh, because those are the guys at, uh, at the coalface solving the problems. So I'm, I'm going to wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. So I, I'm going to ask the panel for effectively what have you learned that's new to you at this conference and to give you a chance to gather your thoughts things I didn't know about before I came here the idea of an immutable server and the idea that you can sign that code and lock it down I think that's a wonderful fantastic way and, and, and it, it speaks to microservices in general when you put a Formula One engine in a Formula One car. You need a brand new chassis, you need different kinds of wheels, and you need whomping brakes to get that thing to turn on a corner. And I think that's for me, is the big transformation of microservices. When you drive all those changes through your organization, you've got to change everything pretty much like Christian had to do at uh, Autoscaler. So, Jason, what have you learned that you didn't know before you came here today? Hard questions sure. now. Um, He's just too smart. He knew it all already. <laughs> no, 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 God no. damn. Not, I knew that not would at be all. A not at all. Uh, so, so from a theme perspective, um, you know, kind of two two part answer, right? So from a theme perspective, craziness is now sanity, right? This whole kind of microservices and you're crazy, my God. Uh, what are you thinking? That's now you know kind of getting into the into the majority, right? And into the to the, uh, the line of sanity. Um, in terms of something particular that I, I, I didn't know uh, before today, I think you know looking at all of the different uh, architectures and, and, and all of the different kinds of proposals that folks had, no matter how different we all are, uh, there is a consistent theme. Um, and uh, so it, just kind of learning that our journey is not, not unique. Yeah. Peter. Uh, my next career move is going to be into COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> Wise choice. <laughs> uh, but seriously, no, actually just to echo what Jason has said there, it's, it's, it's great to, to, to come to these events and actually see the way that the, the whole idea and architecture is being adopted by people and, and to hear the stories that people are putting, putting out there um, and to see the, the thing spread, which is actually, you know, I've kind of always viewed it as being more sanity than insanity, but I don't know. But there you go. But it's just brilliant to see the experiences that people are having and have those conversations. Yeah, Adrian. Um, so I think the, the one of the big things that comes for for me is a, we've done a lot of stuff that's very synchronous. We do a lot of restful calls, a lot of request response, and it's really great to see people ahead of that thinking about asynchrony. Um, and I, I think 
I think there's a, there's a risk there that we may, if we're not careful, fall back into sort of an ESB trap where people try to do synchronous things with asynchronous protocols or asynchronous things with synchronous protocols. Um, so I think we need to be mindful there. But I, I do think it's great to see, you know, uh, to see the idea of people using more asynchronous stuff in, in, um, in microservices. Keith. And um, just, just to echo what the other Jen said, like it, it's, it's great to, we, I go around and I have, like, I have engineers who work for Red Hat, like James Strachan, who just goes, microservices are awesome, and, and a lot of other people to boot. So I, I, have, I kind of view things a lot through a, a kind of, a, micro, a, kind of a, a Red Hat microservices lens. It's great to see other people having basically kind of the same experiences, um, same theories, and, and having some of that validated. Um, I thought some of the numbers that, that you shared, Adrian, on um, the analysis of teams, I'd love to see more people doing more of that and getting that out. I thought you know, the, the five plus or minus two um, people for an ideal team size um, uh, and things like 2,000 lines of code. I think that stuff's really important because it's kind of guidance to people on, on what's, what's, what's the right approach, what you're doing right. People are always, I go to people and they say, what, what, tell me what your best practices are around this. And I kind of go, I don't know. I kind of, I have an idea, um, but I don't have enough data. I think, I think as, as people start sharing more data, it, it's good to see stuff like that. So I think getting more of that stuff out there is great. I'm going to be... I'm asking you for your presentation, by the way. After this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. I'm yeah. I'm gonna get, shoot. In, in like one line, uh, can each of you define what microservices are? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the depth charge question. <laughs> <laughs> Who let him in the room? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Troublemaker. Stump. Microservices are the only thing keeping all of these people between here and the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do, therefore, do not vilify microservices. <laughs> no, I, well, look, I mean, for, for, for me, microservices are massive applications built by a few folks around a pizza. <laughs> It's, it's a return to sanity. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, strong component boundaries enforced um, and uh, something you're prepared to throw away and rewrite without damaging your, your, your organization, right? Uh, small chunks of network available code that do one thing well. Um, I think there was a really great piece of um, kind of academia that was written in 19, I think it was 1973, and it was called Structured Design. It's effectively kind of, you know, really good software and how you write it. And I think microservices is meant to be that. It's just kind of a return to sanity. So, yeah, my view is it's actually we're, we're, we're back on the right path again. Microservices, they're like services, but smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Keen, do you want to make some closing address and then we'll yeah. go and get drinks and whatever? Yeah. Um, not, not, not so much a closing address, but uh, I'd just like to, to thank everyone for coming along today. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the speakers who are all incredibly busy people uh, who've, you know, taken a couple of days out of their schedules and had to prepare talks and, and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, the, the sponsors as well, so, uh, you know, Red Hat, McKinsey and your form uh, for, you know, putting this event on. I hope that everybody, uh, you know, got something valuable out, out of the day. Um, and... Uh, and also to uh, uh, Kleena, who's, who's kind of ducking out of the top of the room, and, and Ian, uh, the two uh, organizers of, of the event at Nearform, who a, did a really great job. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd just like to, to thank everybody. Uh, and beer is going to be served uh, upstairs in a couple of minutes. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Cheers.